So this talk is also uh, known as the Barbenheimer talk. I'm Barbie. The new pink is orange. Orange is the new pink. Sorry, Louisa. Um, and uh, Jam is playing the role of Oppenheimer in this amazing uh, three-act stage play. And the whole thing behind this, the story behind the story behind the story behind, is that both Jam and I have been doing presentations about, about the same topic, but in very different ways. And what we did was we took my Barbie slides, the pink and, you know, no stairs because you can float down from second floor, you know, those kind of slides and combine them with Jam's amazing slide stack with all of the really serious stuff, right? I'm the serious guy. He's the serious guy. Um, serious black? Possibly. Are we getting feedback? A little There's bit. a little bit of feedback. Okay. So we'll stay at the back of the yeah. room. Yeah. Keep okay. away from the speakers. Yes. So. Can you hear me? Uh, right. So, um, we have until the top of the hour, we and have we have 70 slides to get through, so no messing around. Um, the very quick introduction, my name is Jam. I work at a company called Open Strategy Partners. We do communication for agencies and technology companies, and um, I have a long and deep open source background going to back to 2005 and um, very, very happily part of the Typo 3 community and very happy to be here with you today. That's me. I'm Matthias Bortlesniak. I am, uh, well, you can click, yeah, I'm from outside of Oslo. Uh, I have a wife and two kids. I started with Typo 3 in 2003. You've probably heard it, but I think that's really important because I crashed my first Typo 3 installation and that is something everybody does. Even if you've been in Typo 3 for 20 years, yeah, you started out crashing your first installation, right? And I'm a, a member of the Typo 3 Association board. I'm not going for re-election this year because I've also become a Typo 3 project ambassador. And We've been doing this talk around the world at different places in the Americas and the Belgiums and different countries. And uh, people always ask then, you know, what is Typo 3? And so, pretend you're at a Drupal camp. Go. Exactly. And I tell people that, well, Typo 3 is this thing, you know. And Typo 3 is known as having a PHP base. Wow. It's based on PHP. It's free and open source. It's community driven. Yes, it's driven by people like you. And it's backed by an association. And last but not least, it's also got a long history. And people from Drupal says, yeah, that's, that's the same thing for Drupal. We do the same kind of stuff. And then I say yes, because if you look under the surface, we are quite similar. We are actually, oh, the clicker works. We can click. It's actually so that if you look at the core of Drupal, the Drupal core has 54 composer dependencies. Typo 3, on the other hand, has 98. We think a bit differently about what should actually be in the <coughs> core, but that's a different story. But if you look at those dependencies, 33 of those are in common. So two-thirds of the core dependencies of Drupal are also in Typo 3. Wow. But when you look at these common open source CMSs, what do we mostly do when we talk about them? Well, we talk each other down. We're really good at talking. Yeah, come over here. We'll take that outside. Um, and we say, oh, they've got security problems. Oh, they're complex. Oh, they're too easy. But we're really quite the same. And we have much, much bigger problems. We've joined together in the Open Website Alliance that I can talk more about tomorrow. But why are we here, Jan? 
Well, I want to stop there. I want to praise you for a minute, even though you tried to avoid it. Um, Matthias was instrumental in kicking off the Open Website Alliance, which officially started at FOSDEM in Brussels a few weeks ago. And at the board senior leadership level of Drupal WordPress, Joomla, and Typo3, there's, um, they've reached an agreement to promote the open web together. And um, we're, um, and I was very privileged to be invited to host the room at FOSDEM um, and to help with some of the initial communications. Um, and there's a huge potential for us to learn to work together, to do marketing together, and to become um, perhaps some of the answer to the questions that Matthias and I have been asking over the last year, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, the premise, so what we're gonna talk about in the next few, uh, in the next half an hour is let's remember what open source is and what the most important part of it is, um, how that applies in a completely pragmatic way to business and real world issues, um, and then how that same pragmatic value turns into world-changing, um, incredible potential. The Barbie um, stuff. Yeah. So, um, a year and a bit ago, he sent me a link, which really upset me. I was on the team that pitched in and eventually got the Australian government on um, an open source, centralized, centrally serviced platform. In the capital city of Canberra at the time, there were 334 different CMSs in use in the Australian government. Um, we did a ton of work, we did a ton of, um, and it's a great project. Uh, it's a real carrot, not stick thing. There's support or, uh, um, offerings. Um, there's a huge amount of employment in this open source site building and maintaining system. The whole federal government runs on it, six, uh, some number of state, three state governments run on it. Um, one of the government's biggest critics in the world who, who, who makes a lot of noise and yells a lot uses the same open source distribution to run his website as the system that he's criticizing, which is, you know, how awesome is open source? Mm -hmm. Adobe got the right meeting and said, you all need a digital, uh, digital experience platform. And a digital experience platform, you can't do that on that dumb or that, do you have that? Do you have personalization? Like, we don't, we don't have that on ours. Could you please help us? And um, they spent 36 million Australian dollars and I think another up to about 63 million in the end, paying Adobe to prototype a digital experience platform with privatization which was illegal under Australian law because the data retention doesn't provide for that on those platforms. Fantastic. Yeah, I got very upset. Um, we've been complacent. We've been sitting around. We, we won, right? Thank you, Beach. We had to have a beach photo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, near 2001, it wasn't clear that we would all be... Um, well, how many of you in the room make your living from open source software. I mean, yeah. basically everybody, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. It, uh, I don't think it's destroyed the intellectual property business. Interestingly, Microsoft is a huge player in open source now. Um, a very good friend of mine works there and his job is purely open source and requires him to contribute, which is awesome. So last January, we kicked off this project. We went around the world, frankly. Um, I did a, a boff about it here last year, like talking about this topic and this problem and what could we do. And we developed two different presentations. I did mine in New Zealand. Um, and now we have smashed those two presentations together. Um, and basically, you know, we've forgotten what is special about open source because we've been so busy succeeding. And not only have we forgotten what makes us so weird and different, but we've forgotten to tell people. And every year, every day, probably new people come in and they have to make technology choices. What am I gonna study? What am I gonna learn? How's my career going to be? How do I uh, set up something for my department? And we need to tell people about what we do 
every day as well. Um, so that's like that's the big call to action. Yeah, right? we thought we had gotten to the finish line, but it was one round left. Yeah. So open source is a bunch of things. Um, for one, it's freedom. It is absolutely freedom. I mean, that's what we've been enjoying, right? We've been leaning back and thinking, well, you know, ooh, this is cool, free beer. Ah, oh, that's nice. Uh, well, open source is also free speech, by the way. It's your ability to express yourself without anyone really holding you back. It's also the power of choice. You can choose how you want things to work. You can choose what you want to work with. You have amazing possibilities with open source that you basically don't have with other types of software. Gingerbread boy. I love this slide. Do you know the story of the gingerbread boy, the fairy tale? Cool, that means I can tell it. Because, uh, you know, the gingerbread boy is the story of these two people, a man and a wife, and they live together out in the forest and they don't have a child. We don't know why, maybe they don't know how to make it, maybe they you know, have other issues, but one day the wife gets the fantastic idea to, you know, we'll just bake a boy and that will solve our problem. They do that, put the gingerbread boy in the oven, but lo and behold, when they open the oven, the gingerbread boy is alive and he springs out of the oven and he runs out the door and he experiences heaps of fun stuff. And that is how it works with open source as well. When, you know, some programmer sits there and scratches his or her own itch and, you know, solves problems and then publishes open source, something really magic happens. And that is, well, the project starts doing stuff by itself. People start contributing. You know, there's something happening in there with open source. But, do you, you know, the end of the gingerbread boy story is really terrible. He gets eaten by the fox, right? And that tells us something else about open source. It's not just about participation and stuff like that. It's also about puppy. Yup, it's about puppy. We have to care for our open source projects. Everyone has a responsibility to make sure our puppy survives. Open source is not only freedom, it is responsibility as well. Jam. Right, so with all of that um, in place, I want to rewind to the most basic, to the fundamental level of what we're dealing with. Um, and I have used this to help a lot of people sell a lot of projects. Um, <clears throat> we generally agree that we have four freedoms as the base for open source practice. Um, there are differing definitions out there, but fundamentally, we are free to use open source software for anything. The government critic is allowed to use the government distribution, open source software distribution, to criticize the government, for example, and that's fine. Um, we're allowed to look at the code and study it and understand it and get any help we need to decide if it's good enough, secure enough, fast enough, appropriate for what we want to do with it. We're allowed to take it wherever it is, make changes until it is exactly what we need, right? Within our own abilities or our budget, right? And then what makes this a virtuous circle is that we can create that perfect solution for running a government department, or a dentist's office, or a golf club, and give that, or sell that, to someone else. And as soon as we can give it to someone else, you know, a bunch of us in the early 2000s realized, hey, well, you know, if I fix this, you don't have to fix this, and if I put that in the middle, and then you look at it, um, you get something back better, and then you've put your best idea in, and then, and then we all put our best ideas together, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We get better and better software for free. And this genuine um, enlightened self-interest has created these incredible professional communities of practice around the world, cross-border, cross-discipline, right? So this is already a superpower. Uh, this, this cycle is, is incredibly powerful for us. Um, 
And it lets us do pitches where we say, hey, if you're going to spend a million euros on a project, um, spend a million euros on features and functionality that Typo 3 doesn't have in it yet, that Drupal doesn't have in it yet, that whatever you're solving doesn't have in it yet. So classic example, used it in a lot of sales slides. If you don't have a license fee of 30 money, um, then you can, you can get a better UX experience, you can get a better implementation, you can add more features, you can do more testing. Mm -hmm. You get a better project for the same budget. And 30 money can be quite a lot of cash. 30 money? I'm going to be talking about the money. Um, right? So then we can talk about the difference between a proprietary project and an open source project in a completely pragmatic way. We can't sell our projects that they're free. We can't sell open source software that it's free. We have to set expectations properly. Every IT project has a lot of costs. Um, and we, as IT professionals, we need to pay our rent too, and <clears throat> we're not cheap. So all, we have all of those costs in common. Then, if I have to ask permission to use your product and pay per seat to see if it's going to work for me, because I don't even know when I'm already paying. Instead of that, with open source, I can invest in the team, I can test, right? What is it gonna cost me? A developer in two weeks' time, right? To test whether it's gonna be there. I can invest in better training, I can invest only in the features I need. The right color of blue for my logo, the right, the right corners on my buttons, whatever it is. The important stuff. Right, now, this next point becomes super important in a couple slides later. In Dusseldorf, there are how many Type of 3 agencies? I used to know. It's hundreds mm -hmm. of Type of 3 agencies just in Dusseldorf, right? And across Central Europe, and depending on what technology and where you are in what market, choosing an open source software that's supported in your local region allows you to have an incredible uh, uh, diversity of offerings and possibilities and collaborations and cooperations, and not just work with Microsoft or Oracle or whomever. Um, if you're doing your own implementation, you get to own the data, plan your software where you need it, and do the things you need when you need them. It's a super easy, pragmatic set of decisions to be in control of the infrastructure that you're relying on um, to, to support your business. The security question still comes up. People still don't it's counterintuitive, right? But like, yes, it's secure. Yes, you can see my code. Encryption is a thing, and so on. But the more transparent we are about the inner workings of our stuff, the better the chance is that it is going to be safe and secure. And major open source projects like Typo3, like Drupal, and a few others have been used by so many governments and enterprises mm -hmm that practically by definition, there's a security expert looking at it right now, doing pen testing right now. Our code base in Typo 3 is extraordinarily resilient and extraordinarily secure. And the really interesting thing is that these guys with the eagle there and the stars, they have done that themselves. Uh, previously. There is, you know, the open skies agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States. That was all about, well, you know, place your planes out there so we can see them with our satellites. That's the way to create trust and security that everyone can actually see how many weapons you have. Well, that is exactly the same thing as we do. You don't get better by hiding something. So, um, my dad used to tell a story, and we're not, we've not, we're not in the restaurant business, I don't know why he told this story, but he would say, you gotta own the bricks. You rent a place in a good location, you open your restaurant in it, you're a good cook, people start to come, people walk past, they notice it, they smell it, they start eating there, you get more and more bookings, you're full all the time, you're working great, your landlord comes by to eat every now and then, and you know, a year into your business, you're doing awesome. And your landlord starts finally says, I love your fajitas, um, this place is so, so great, and you're doing great. I'm doubling your rent. Yippee. And if you're in the restaurant business, location is almost literally everything. Um, and you've built up this whole reputation and this whole, these reviews and all, you're on the maps and everything. What you have no choice, right? Um, now, this is the same thing if you 
build your business, you build your government infrastructure on software that you don't own and control. I don't want my government putting our infrastructure with my tax money into other countries and infrastructure that they can't control and update. And in an incredible stroke of irony, reality, in the, just in the last couple of weeks, is proving us right. Ha ha. Um, firstly, in Denmark. Yeah, we translated this uh, title very nicely. But basically, yes, municipalities are seeing their costs soar. And somehow they don't know how to get out of that vicious circle. Ah, libraries are a non-profit, right? Yeah, they are. They don't sell books. They give it all back to the readers, that kind of stuff. Well, not to Microsoft. Uh, in uh, a municipality city in Denmark, they have now been told that, well, Microsoft does no longer see libraries as non-profit, so here you go, 40,000 euros more every year to pay your licenses. Fantastic. We love that. Right. But How Microsoft, do they get out of that? Microsoft captured the library um, software market by giving them non-profit pricing, essentially as good as for free, and now that everybody's locked into using that, they're like, by the way, we changed our mind. So, that's terrible. A friend of mine published this on LinkedIn a week ago, and um, this guy named Fred Play, he runs Platform SH, you might have heard of. Um, Today marks a challenging moment for numerous e-commerce merchants. I know you can read this. Shopify, their chosen vendor, has just impl implemented a substantial uh, price increase. Da, 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 da. I'm convinced that owning the code of your e-commerce store is crucial as opposed to merely renting it from a SaaS or low-code provider. Shopify has substantially increased its plus pricing today, a staggering 60% surge in the variable fee, a 25% uptick in the fixed monthly fee, and a 33% spike in Shopify payments. Even better, if you're doing B2B payments, Shopify's increased its take of the payment by 18%. So, whew, that is super hard, which is why I say, you gotta own the bricks. There are, you know, Magento, Shopware, Ibexa, Drupal Commerce, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of other open source options that we should be using. Now, that's all the pragmatic stuff, business stuff. Back, back to, to Barbie. The, back to the world of idealism. Yeah. And, I mean, listening to these stories, has open source won? Well, you might be doing your business on open source, but I can tell you, if you go out there on the street and talk to normal people, well, not that you're not normal, but anyway, um, <laughs> yep, <laughs> you know. Well, very often when it comes to procurement and software, uh, we talk about the government, because the government is big and it has a lot of money, right? So it can move big stuff, like in Germany, or in Dutch municipalities. Um, very often, uh, you talk to politicians and they're on one of two sides. Either they say, <coughs> the government should do it all. Everything should be within the government and the government should have full control all the time. If you go to the other side, they say, well, the government should be as small as possible and the public sector should do everything and control everything and be in power. The private and sector. <gasps> well, both of these solutions are, per definition, proprietary. The government keeps it or the private sector keeps it. What we are doing in open source is actually neither. We are contributing to what you could call civil society. Civil society is what happens with individuals when we get together as private people and do something great together, like a choir or uh, a rotary club or something like that. It is the power of community. By involving civil society, the government and private sector can collaborate on creating great solutions by creating community. And by the way, in 2022, civil society won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, we're one of those people. This is an image I use a lot. It's a desert, if you don't know it. Um, this, for me, is the example of proprietary software. It is a monoculture, it's just sand, right? 
it's only one way of doing things and if you want to have water in this uh, environment and that is you need to know the guy who owns the watering hole right but that guy can choose at any moment to increase his prices he can shut you out he can do whatever he wants because he owns the watering hole it is a situation ba based on dependency it is well to draw the analogy mono technical this, on the other hand, is the lovely jungle, where everyone exists all at the same time doing their stuff, but would any of this exist if everyone was fighting each other? No, it wouldn't. Everything works together. There is not so much a dependency, there is an interdependency between all of the plants. As soon as one plant takes over everything, it's a monoculture again, and we've got the problem, right? But we manage this. We survive because of collaboration. And back to the sand. What do you do with a desert if you want, to t uh, want it to go away? Sand just, you know, runs between your fingers. What do you do? Do you, you know, buy a spade and you shovel it away? No, what do you do? You plant trees, right? The, it's not only the roots that holds the sand together, but it creates a lot of organic living matter, life, community within the soil, and that holds the desert down, creates soil, makes everything livable again. So I said I was gonna talk about money again. Um, since we're on the topic of governments and, and doing better and being a society, um, there's a really interesting and weird um, side effect and superpower of open source as well. Um, classically, um, you know, b governments in the sort of countries that we have the privilege of living in and a society that, that we have being a part of, um, governments generally consider it their mission to make life better um, on average for all of us. And they have a lot of different ways they can do that. They can spend money on infrastructure. They can decide that bridging a bridge is, imp uh, uh, bridging a, a river is important. Commerce and Tinder dates between the two sides will increase. Awesome. Um, you spend the hundred money on that, it's done. Um, it's um, quite clear that improving the health of um, a country's citizens mm, makes that, uh, the outcomes in that country better. Interestingly, a lot of governments also choose to send vaccinations or medical help to other countries to increase, uh, you know, improve the conditions there because the government thinks that perhaps they'll get less immigration, perhaps they'll get um, world peace, whatever it is. There are very good reasons to take care of other people in the world. You can spend a hundred money on that, it's a legitimate thing. Other countries decide to spend a hundred money on fireworks, making other places worse, which is, um, we could talk about that a lot. Um, it's not that I like it or agree with it, but it's a, these, are, these are classical ways to spend a hundred money and, and then you spent it, there is an outcome that you might have predicted and you move on. Um, while those are all necessary, if you spend a hundred money creating government digital infrastructure, um, all of a sudden, um, you've, got, you've got some amazing powers. Um, you can start to um, see, if I build that government department solution once and I make it great, and then another department uses it, and another department uses it, and another, the effective cost goes down and down and down for each implementation, and the effective value of what I've built goes up and up and up, and that's amazing. Digital infrastructure in open source gets more valuable every time someone else takes it and uses it. Um, so, so this is an incredible alternative to think about, and um, it gives people employment, it keeps money in your local economy, rather than sending it out to whomever, and there's, so we have an actual data set that shows that um, this is real and true. Um, before 2010, the UK government back when they were part of Europe. The UK government um, in 2010 started on a digital transformation project. Um, in 2010, this was the I, 
CT, because the UK says that instead of IT. Um, the ICT supplier map for the UK government was, you can pretty much see Reading, um, Brighton, London, and I don't know what that bit in the middle is. Um, and that maps directly to Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, HP, and the usual players. That was the UK government's money essentially sending hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds to foreign companies um, to get their digital work done. In 2010, the UK government started this digital transformation process. It was large and complex. It involved changing procurement. Um, it involved um, a whole number of things, but they did two things within a larger package. Um, they said four projects at a price point of 100 million pounds or less, um, small and medium enterprises could bid on those projects. So all of a sudden, smaller companies could access government um, um, calls for projects. And they said, in the case of equal functionality, a preference will be given to open source solutions over proprietary solutions. That was the map in 2010. They did a pilot project, and then they rolled it out, and by 2014, four years later, this was the supplier map in the UK, right? Four years, a preference for open source and small business. All of that money, right? I don't know the actual number, but I imagine 80, 90% of the money suddenly stayed in the economy, created jobs in the UK, created more opportunities for more people to have a better life. The best part, and weirdly, I find, is the five dots in Ireland, which is Europe. But anyway, it's not the UK. But still, great story. Yeah, maybe collaboration is happening. Community. Well, who knows? One dark and stormy night, the telephone rang at the Typo 3 office. We don't have that old telephones, but it's an illustrative photo, so don't think anything about our technology. It was the government of Rwanda. Have you heard this story before? They called and they said, we have 250 Type of 3 installations that we need to upgrade. Can you help us? And, uh, well, how could we help them? Well, you know, we could have done like many do and just called up a large agency, maybe in Dusseldorf or somewhere else, and said, well, you know, you guys just take this on, earn some money on these randoms who called us. Is that the way we want to do it and open source? Just put projects to one agency and say, well, you solve it, uh, this is your problem. <laughs> well, you know, that's actually the way a lot of business happens when it goes to countries like Rwanda today. It's usually an established business that opens a local office, earn money, and then they just export the money, take it out of the country, right? They use closed solutions with nice stuff like vendor lock-in, and that creates financial dependence. So they earn money by creating dependence on others. Well, I've seen this before. I learned about this in school. It's called colonialist, and it is exploitative. That is not the way Type of 3 should do things, right? So we thought differently. We thought that, well, why can't we use our community? So we use our community to create independent local businesses in Rwanda that could serve their government. There is a report about it. You can use the QR code and read up on it later. But what happened was really, really amazing. And it ties up to all of the things that we have spoken about earlier today. This is how it looked. Individuals from Type of 3 agencies went to Rwanda and taught people at agencies and in government how to use Type of 3. And Type of 3 is open source, so they could build businesses on this. This is how it looks today. 350 websites. The goal is 500 run on Type of 3 in Rwanda, multilingual, multi site. I think they have four different instances running Type of 3 for all of those sites, all managed within Rwanda by <coughs> Rwandans for the Rwandan government. Hmm. This is the very long newspaper title that I tried to come up with that encompasses everything that we 
did there. So we took a democratic and non, not for profit open source project and we supported sustainable and independent local business. Yes, can you do that with proprietary software in the same way? Hmm, I don't know. Jam. Yeah. So the procurement people in the government just somehow d didn't understand themselves what they were dealing with. Um, the I have some figures here. I was I know Sharon, who runs GovCMS in Australia. Um, so as I said, there were 350 plus CMSs in Canberra alone before the implementation. Um, because of this installation, there is an, a vendor community and a market for software services that's developed in Australia. Um, the people of Australia share the load and, and do the work. They share code with each other. They're saving something in the region of 100 million dollars, Australian dollars a year, um, using open source instead of proprietary. It's probably a little bit more by now. Um, the entire platform is open source. Um, it's fully secured. It's fully cached. I was just looking, there's, um... But, but, but look, while he's looking, I can tell you, you know, what happens when Australia adopts Adobe, right? They pay them millions, hundreds, of millions of dollars over time. That money they send out of the country. They don't support their local business. And the work doesn't have to get done in Australia. Exactly. And the taxes don't have to be paid in Australia. Mm -hmm. But when you work with your government and you co-create a software together, you also create business opportunities for yourself because you can take this open source software that nobody prevents you from using and use it for other projects as well. That is power. So this thing about locally led, non-exploitative and anti-colonial is something that also actually works everywhere, not just in developing countries, but in developed rich nations as well. But most importantly, what this does is that it develops community. And what is this community? Well, Jam. We've talked today about the original, the origins of who we are and what we do now, um, the, the, what the freedoms and the responsibilities that we get having these wonderful toys and tools. Um, we told you how easy it is to make really pragmatic uh, explanations for business financial return on investment reasons to use open source software. Um, Hypo3 is leading the world in delivering a new kind of international aid, which is incredible and empowering. Um, we, so just next finished, we just finished our uh, proposal for Somalia, for example. We've been to Papua New Guinea. We're going to talk with Angola next. It's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. so. so this value of open source, doing open source, is more than just your business value. It does something to your society. Working together, solving problems together is building democracy, for example. It makes you better in other ways. Well, basically, it's peaceful coexistence. And these values that we are working with in open source, whenever you push code or you work together with somebody in Type of 3, those are democratic, peaceful values that we really need in the world today. Because yes, democratic values are under attack in the world today, and open source strengthens civil society that's standing behind and supporting it everywhere, including here. So we'd really like everyone to sit back and remember how special we are and how weird some of this is and it really needs explaining over and over again. You don't learn open source in school. That's terrible. Pe right. So... How much time do we have? We're over time. No. no. But I was at an embassy. Five minutes. See, we've got lots of time. And we've got two slides left. I was left. trying to wrap up. 
I was at an embassy and I had a 45 minute ap appointment with uh, a diplomat there to tell about Type of 3 and all the great stuff Type of 3 is doing in the global south and Africa, other places. Of those 45 minutes, I spent 30 minutes trying to explain what open source is and why it's possible to run a business based on open source. Yes, it's free. Yes, it's under your control. Yes, it's secure. Yes, we give away our best ideas. Yes, they come back better. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk to people about the bigger picture. Right? This. So, you know, I have tens of thousands of friends sharing their smartest ideas, ideas with each other. Whether or not they're competing out in the world for, for projects and whatever, it doesn't matter. We get to do all of this together. We make each other better. We now need to look outwards and tell the world open source. Matthias and I envision a world where um, someone looking for a technology solution might decide, I am going to choose proprietary, fine, have a nice day. I am going to choose open source. Great. Now, which project, which level of the stack, like, and just make that choice first and then go on a journey of discovery with us. And if you know how good open source is, if you have to choose between open source and proprietary, and you are a government, what are you going to choose? Well, you're going to choose open source because it supports what you are, a good society for your citizens. I think that's pretty much it. Thank you.